Hi there, I'm Wendy McCallum, burnout and alcohol coach and wellness expert, and you're listening to Bite Size Balance, where everyday extraordinary women share their stories, expertise, and wisdom, all in the name of lifting each other up and creating a better life by design. Whether it's wellness, career, relationships, food, alcohol, mindfulness, hormones, or parenting, we talk about all things women's balance. If your life looks great on paper, but it still feels like something's missing, you're in the right place. Welcome to Bite Size Balance. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Bite Size Balance. I have a really special guest here today. I'm so happy to have my friend and fellow coach Maureen Benkovich here today. Hey, Maureen, how are you? Hi, Wendy. Good. How are you? I'm good. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Maureen and why I wanted to have her on the on the podcast. So Maureen has been a fitness and health enthusiast for over 30 years. She ran a successful private personal training and Pilates studio, taught a variety of fitness classes, and even competed in two figure competitions in her early 40s. All the while, alcohol was a part of it, waiting in the wings, ready to help her celebrate her achievements and take her right back into the detox to retox cycle. As someone who experienced both depression and the pain of infertility, Maureen learned firsthand how easy it is to get stuck in a cycle of shame and blame when it comes to drinking. For years, she used alcohol as a way to cope with these challenges, but it only made things worse. But with the help of compassionate support and the latest neuroscience-based techniques, she was able to break free from those patterns and transform her life. Now, as a certified life coach, she's committed to helping others do the same. So I wanted to have Maureen on because I've just only recently become aware of this piece of Maureen's story that I didn't know about, which is her own journey through infertility and adoption. And her perspective on this is different than mine. I mean, pieces of it we have in common, but lots of pieces of it, certainly the outcome for Maureen is different than the outcome that I had in my own, my with my own recurrent miscarriage and adoption attempts. And so I was really eager to have Maureen come on and talk about this, because I think this is a topic that we don't talk about enough. And obviously I've recorded a couple of episodes on my own story, but I'm really, I think it's really important to share all the different perspectives on this and for us to be talking about this more openly as women so that there hopefully is less, first of all, I I can't stand the thought of somebody feeling like they're the only one who's feeling this, but also just, I just know the power of of sharing your story and what that can do for someone else. So Maureen was generous enough to agree to come on here and share her story for what I think is the first time on a podcast, right, Maureen? In detail, yes. Yeah. So I I really appreciate it. I know how hard it can be to talk about this topic. And so I really appreciate it. And we're going to go super gentle and just have a really hopefully enlightening and heartwarming conversation around this really tough topic, which is infertility and depression and drinking and how all of those things came together for you like they did for me but your yours your story is obviously different so I want to start with with the with your experience with trying to start a family and and how that all went for you and just so everyone who knows listening knows I I don't know Maureen's story so I'm, I'm just genuinely going I'm going to be learning as as you're listening here so does that feel like a good place to start Yeah, that's definitely a good place to start. You know, it's very timely with Mother's Day weekend coming this weekend. It it always comes up for me at this time, always watching all the commercials and it's always hard. Uh, And it's, it's been a long time now. And this time of the year is always difficult, Mother's Day. But this time I'm doing something different. I'm sharing my story and... I hope that will help others who feel like I do. So I'll start in the beginning. When I was in college, I had endometriosis and started getting treated for that. And I met my husband right out of college. I was a pharmaceutical rep and he was a dental student. And we got engaged fairly quickly. And part of that reason was because I shared with him that my gynecologist said, if you think you want to have children, you really should think about doing it sooner rather than later. So we got married. We were the first of our friends to get married at 26 and 27. And we probably started trying to have children about two years into that. And we got pregnant right away, which we fully expected we would. I'm from five children. I'm the last of five. He's from four children. So never did we think we would have an issue. 
And I remember I was so excited. Of course, I told everybody, told my family, and I was actually traveling to go see my sister in California. And we were both very athletic at that time. And we did something called the Santa Monica Steps. We ran up and down the Santa Monica Steps. It's a well-known landmark. But I had been a person who was exercising all the time, taught aerobics. I was in good shape. So it wasn't like this was an unusual thing to do. But we came back home from that day and we're making dinner. And then I started to spot and bleed and realized I was having a miscarriage. And it was just so shocking. I called my doctor who was not on California time. It was actually two in the morning at his place. And he called me back. And because right away I thought, this is my fault. I exercised too hard. I did the Santa Monica steps and this is what happened. But he reassured me that it just wasn't a viable pregnancy. So then that was really hard, but I did know that this is not uncommon for people starting out. And so that I had every hopes and expectation that we would get pregnant. But as six months went by and a year went by, we realized this wasn't happening. And with my history of endometriosis, we went to a fertility clinic and we went to probably one of the better ones in the area, the DC metro area. And that's when I was told I had hypothyroidism, which is something I never knew. They diagnosed that. So it got me on medicines for that. And we started the fertility treatment and that whole process is horrible. <laughs> I don't know if, if you went through where they take out your eggs and they fertilize them outside of the body. And then they, what they do is it's actually, they overstimulate your ovaries to make a lot of eggs. So at first they shut you down. You're kind of in menopause. You're actually having hot flashes and, and you're in menopausal sort of state. And then they hyperstimulate your ovaries to make a lot of eggs. And then they take out the eggs and then they fertilize them with your husband's sperm. And they hope that some will be viable to re-implant as pregnancies. It's a pretty stressful process because they will start calling you, well, you have 12 viable egg and sperm, you know, pregnancies. And they call you the next day. Well, now you have seven. And they call you the next day and six and five and four. And ours would always go down to the lowest number, but there were two. And so they implanted them. And, you know, of course I was tentative, but still feeling pretty positive. We were young, we were healthy, didn't see there would be a problem. And about the same time frame, eight weeks, I miscarried again. And it was so hard because everybody around me, the things that people would say, well-meaning, I understand that, but things like, well, you know, you shouldn't exercise or you shouldn't work <laughs> or, you know, oh, it was only eight weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a painful one, you know, and I, I, I hope people know now that to, to someone who's pregnant, you immediately become a mother in your brain. You know, you feel like you're a mother. So whether it's a bunch of cells to you, it's a baby. It was a baby to me. And so that was a tough miscarriage. And then of course we tried again. And this is very difficult, very expensive process. At that time, I don't know what they're doing now. It wasn't covered by insurance. And they tried something different. And this time down to two eggs again, and they implanted them. Same thing, got to eight weeks and miscarried. And we were just so frustrated. It was a big machine, this fertility clinic. And we thought, well, maybe we're not with the right doctor. Maybe it's, you know, we're just a number there. So we left and went to a different doctor and he was sort of old school and he had this kind of serum. It was a progesterone serum that was in oil suspension. And my husband had to inject it into me every night in, in the backside. It was very painful because it was an oil suspension. And I would literally cry um, and he would feel horrible. But we were, this doctor said, this was definitely the way to go. And unfortunately, I got something called ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And it's extremely painful. I even had to go on morphine for a couple of days because I couldn't even stand up. And of course, then they give you some other drug to stop the ovarian stimulation process. So that failed you know, all that time and effort, money, sweat and tears, literally also failed. And 
I wanted to do another fertility treatment. My husband was just, he felt terrible injecting this stuff into me. He felt terrible how depressed I was. I already have, have had depression and I'm prone to it. And so this was really taking me down. And so we decided to take a break from doing fertility treatments and focus on each other because we were not focused on each other. You could get just so caught up in, in this. And, and we just decided that we weren't going to do it again for a while. And then we eventually just said, you know what, if, if, if God wants us to get pregnant, we'll get pregnant, but we just, I'm not going to do that anymore. It was just such a horrific three miscarriages one, actually four. So one naturally and three through fertility treatments. We were just done. And during that time we had moved, we were done doing fertility treatments. I want to say, but I still in my heart still hope we were going to have children and we had moved to a, a beautiful old house on the water and we just envisioned this would be such a great place to raise children there was you know a dock and boating and the schools were good we had looked into all of that still very hopeful but as the years went by it was evident this was not going to happen and adoption wasn't really on our radar but we were going to a church and it was a smaller church and everybody knew we wanted to get pregnant people would pray for us and you know our pastor we were very close to him and his wife and they came over to our house one night they said listen we have a couple of this come to the church and their daughter is pregnant and and she they want to adopt and they're looking for christians and they weren't they came to our church seeking this and they said here's the kicker she's going to deliver in a month and this would be done very differently she she would like to meet you and so this was not a formally structured open adoption through any sort of agency. We were not really thinking of adoption, but it was kind of in my mind, like, oh, this is it. This is baby on the doorstep. This must have been the whole reason why we couldn't get pregnant because this young girl is going to come here. And, mm -hmm. and it's so obvious, you know, this is what's, what was meant to be. So we wrote letters to her why we would be such good parents because there were two other couples, I guess they were considering. And she picked us, that she wanted us to be the parents of her child. And then she wanted to come over and meet us, as I said, and her mother came, they wanted to see the house and the yard. And I know in your story, you talked about that too, which I totally understood. And, and like you, I think I cleaned that house spick and span from top to bottom, and maybe even the garage, <laughs> you know, not where they would even see. But they came over and she was a sweet young girl and, and she, we walked around the yard and she said, oh, I could just imagine what a great life he's going to have. It was a boy and she felt really good about it. I felt really good about it. And we walked away that we were going to move forward with this adoption. And my father was a lawyer, is, was a lawyer and I had called him and he was representing us and they had their lawyer too. So we worked out all the details. And meanwhile, I, I shared it with our church family. And so people were giving us baby stuff and because this is going to happen fast. There's this, we're, I didn't have anything. And so people were just being so generous and I had all kinds of baby things. And, you know, we were mentally ready, physically ready. And then two weeks before the adoption, the mother, of the young girl called and added a few things. She's like, well, we would really like to be able to travel with him and birthdays and holidays and celebrations and, and kind of kept adding on all these things that we hadn't talked about. And it was getting kind of strange. And I know I talked to my father and he gave me some advice and we, we told them that we weren't comfortable with all that they were asking for. And then a day or two later, they just shut down the whole process. But the way in which they did it was painful because they did it through their lawyer. And they said, all adoption proceedings will cease and desist. And you will not contact us. And you will not especially contact our daughter. And, the, you know, just leave us alone. And I was distraught. It was, it was worse than a miscarriage at that time. It was, yeah. you know, every, everything goes through your mind. How am I going to tell everybody? What about all this? baby stuff 
and are, are you sure she changed her mind? Because I know when we were walking around the yard together, she really wanted this. So I was just so confused and so hurt and so angry. Yeah. Like my anger now is really, really coming up. And I recently, because, you know, I started sharing this about my story, infertility and depression. I recently found out that that young woman passed away just recently. And what had happened was actually the mother who we met of the young girl didn't want to give the baby up for adoption. It was the young girl who did. And so she had her keep the child. And then she, the mother adopted her daughter's child. Right. And then that young woman went on to have a very hard life and just recently passed away. So it's just sad closure all the way around. Like what would it have been? You know, I don't know for her, or for us, but then I was just truly done. I just couldn't, couldn't think of doing fertility treatments again. Didn't want to adopt. I didn't even know that kind of a thing could happen <laughs> with an adoption. So I was just shut down completely. And at the same time, all of my friends, my young friends are having children. I'd already gone through with two of my best friends. They had eat, we'd all gotten pregnant at the same time. Mm. And then I miscarried and they continued on and both had their first child. Each had a boy. Yeah. And then one, again, they were both trying. And one of my friends had been going, undergoing fertility treatments like I had. And she came over to our house. We were having a party and I can see it as clear as day right now where she was standing, what she was wearing. And I offered her a drink and she said, no. And I said, what's going on? And she said, I'm pregnant, Maureen. And, you know, you feel badly that someone has to be so careful telling someone they're pregnant. She, she almost, I could tell it was painful for her to tell me because she knew. And I so wanted to be happy for her. So I tried to be happy for her in that moment. And, and I think this is the first time I probably drank directly in response to incredible pain. I think I, I, I turned around and drank, and drank maybe a couple shots to try to get through the day. But we went to a lunch out, out on the water having crabs. And of course, they're talking about it now. Everyone is talking about it. And I'm trying to keep it together. But I knew I was going to lose it. And it didn't help that I was drunk. <laughs> and I... This is very, not a good thing, but I grabbed my car keys, my husband's car keys. And I said, I got to go. And I left and I drove home. Fortunately, it was close, but I still shouldn't have driven home. But I remember driving home and holding onto the wheel and just screaming at the top of my lungs. Why not me? Why not me? And that was so hard, but it was, it was from that point on, you know, my friends didn't know what to say to me. It was awkward. There were baby showers. There was more babies. There was, and so I started to somewhere along the way, just really lean into the whole party girl persona. Like, oh, look at me. I don't care. I don't care that I don't have children. I don't really want them anyway. You know, look at all the fun I can have. So that started to take hold, but I, I wasn't aware. It wasn't a thing. I said, I'll become this, you know, I just was looking for an identity because and I've heard other women say this through all those miscarriages. I thought, well, who, who am I as a woman? You know, I mean, this is like the thing we're put on earth to do in a way, you know, and I came from a big Italian family and it was like, we were my geared toward this, you know, my dad, I wanted to be a lawyer like you. And he was a lawyer and um, he he said, no, 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 become a teacher. So you can have the summers off. So you can have your children. You know, everything was about having children and being a mom. So I definitely was like geared and raised that way. So when, when that didn't happen, I just couldn't figure out who I was in the world. I tried on a bunch of different identities, all hiding all the pain and the loss I was feeling. I wasn't you know, seeking support. I wasn't reaching out and I just really felt there was no one like me because everybody I knew ha had children. So I just felt very alone and I didn't reach out because I didn't think there was any point. And there was a shame in there too. You know, when I look at it now, it's like, how can I be ashamed? It wasn't my fault, but I was ashamed. 
Like I was, I was defective, broken, you know, less than, not enough. Um, well, how, did you have, so, I'm so sorry to interrupt. I just, yeah. as you said that, I was thinking like, of course, did you have the same thing that I had where people would ask you what, if anybody knew what was wrong with you? Oh, people yeah. ask me that all the time. Have they figured out what's wrong? What's wrong with mm. you? Have they figured that out? Yeah. Oh, all the time. Again, how can you yes. not, how can you not feel defective when someone's asking right. a question? Like, you know, again, note to self, if you're listening and you haven't had Maureen's experience or an ex any experience with this, like, don't ask, don't ask that question. I remember that one coming up a lot. And I mean, it's, you're going to blame yeah. yourself. You're going to blame yourself because that's what we do, but you don't need other people asking you that question. Right. Because you don't have an answer. You're like, I don't know what's wrong. With, what's wrong with me? You know, right. that statement. Well, yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, it took me to, it took me like two decades to realize like maybe nothing. Right. Or maybe like, <laughs> maybe there's something happening on my husband's side. Never crossed my mind. Right. It was always my fault. I don't know if you felt that way, but that's the way I always felt. Yes, I definitely, I would say to him, I'm so sorry. If you want to, I literally would say things like, if you want to marry somebody else so you can have children I would get it you know and right we didn't know really wh where it was coming from and actually you I you know you know how this is at that time I was desperate to seek out any kind of medical help and there was a doctor in our town well he was a obstetrician in China when he came here he couldn't he didn't have his medical license so he became you know an acupuncturist herbalist but he was an obstetrician and I'd heard really good things about him so I went to him and he did these kind of tests that were kind of woo-woo, but he said to me, and this is when we were still, I still in active fertility treatments. He said, you have something we won't be able to figure out. And he's like, it's not going to be successful. And of course I didn't want to hear that. Like, what was, what was that? <laughs> you know, that was a waste, but he actually was right because at the end of our fertility treatment, we did go to a doctor in Chicago who was like top in her field. And we gave her everything she asked for, all the samples, all the tests, all the previous information about what had happened. And she gave us the same medical conclusion that you two, by all rights, as far as we can tell, should be getting pregnant. We have no idea why you're not. And um, we don't have an answer for you. <laughs> so a lot of money to get to get that. Mm -hmm. response so that was just it that was the absolute end and then this is just sort of a sidebar but in 2011 my husband was diagnosed with prostate cancer at age 40 45 so pretty young and i was trying to think yeah 45 and i thought really god really <laughs> like all this happens and so i was so angry all the time mm -hmm. underneath uh, all that you now when you've met me you would not know that it's not like I was letting anybody know that no mm -hmm. I was the person who looked like they had it all together mm -hmm. and they were having a great time and they were quite happy with all children but underneath it was a whole other story sure I'm happy to say he has been cancer free for 11 years he had a successful procedure and everything is great but that all that together all that loss all that pain and then that unsure time period of what was going to happen with him was just really a tough time. Oh, sure. That's so much. Yeah. I'm so sorry to hear all of that, Maureen. And you just did such a good job of, of going through all of that. I, I, I just remember the first time I shared anything about this, I was just so awkward about all of it. And that was just so eloquent the way you described that. So thank you for, for sharing all of that. That sounds really, really hard. And I'm really, really sorry that you went through that. Thank you. Can we talk about, so the drinking, which is like, you know, I want to talk about that a bit too, because I, this is something that, as I said to you earlier, before we hit record, we were kind of talking about like making the connections and when that happens. And for me, like it, it was, it wasn't until really, I started recording those couple of episodes I recorded on my own recurrent miscarriages and then the adoption, our adoption process, which we had a different ending than yours, but going through that, re the recording of that is th that's the first time that I put together, like, and I also the uh, writing, I have to be honest, I, I was writing yeah. like a, a lot of nonfiction. So I was writing a lot about what it was like to be 
what like burnout and modern motherhood and this infertility journey and all of that was kind of like, it was all in there. Mm -hmm. That's when I made the connection with the drinking, but up until like a few years ago, I would not have said there was any connection between the experiences that I had becoming a mother and the drinking. And I'm just curious, like when that connection, did you, did you always know that that was one of the reasons why you were drinking or was it just, you know, and, and if not, when did that become apparent to you? No, I did not Mm. No, that was why I was drinking. I did not make that correlation at all. Honestly, it was just recently, (laughs) very recently as I've been journaling and, you know, I went through the path of this naked mind, the path, and that was a year long process of reevaluating my relationship with alcohol and doing a lot of work on myself. And that theme kept coming up, the anger, the disappointment. And it just clicked for me like, wow, I have all these years so far away from from the last traumatic event hold in holding on to this disappointment and anger and keeping myself isolated. I didn't want to share with people because I didn't want to ever discourage somebody who was maybe Mm. going through fertility treatments or going through a hard time because my story doesn't have a happy ending in that regard. But then I just recently realized as I've, get deeper in this journey of being a coach that when we go through a painful event it's 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 one of the best things to do is to share that vulnerably and authentically with others because there are people out there who are going through what I went through I I didn't think there there was but there really are and to be able to share that and help others makes it not, I'm not going to say worthwhile, but makes it have more meaning and validation and to be able to help others is motivating. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so true. And it's doesn't make it any easier to do, but I think I certainly have felt like some of those experiences that we went through have had, have more meaning as a result of me being able to support other families mm-hmm. who are going through this, going through the same, the same thing. And I definitely think on the, on the drinking side, I mean, both of us are now certified as naked mind coaches. And I know that you support, you support people in finding freedom from alcohol, like I do, but finding a coach who has a similar life experience as yours can be such a relief mm-hmm. and it can just you know, can drop some barriers. I mean, I wish I'd had someone to talk to about all of this. I did not know anyone else who was, I didn't, I didn't know anyone else who had had four, four miscarriages. I mean, you and I have that in common, but I, I, I haven't met very many women who've had that same experience. I've met some since, but at the time it felt like I was the only one. And certainly I know that feeling that you were describing of other people starting their families and going to baby showers and having people asking you every single time you said no to a drink, if you were pregnant or if there was, you know, Mm -hmm. all of that stuff and definitely feel, I, I, I have empathy for the feeling that you have around mother's day. And I've talked about that before. I try to be so sensitive around mother's day. And actually, as we're recording this, I'm trying to figure out if there's a way for me to get this on the schedule. Like it's not going to happen before mother's day. It's going to come afterwards, but but I do think it's a topic worth talking about. I mean, we, you know, we just don't, we're, we're we're not thinking about it on mother's day. Mm -hmm. We're not thinking about all the women for whom uh, mothering has not been possible or mothering has been, has been, has involved devastating loss. The mothers who have lost their children, the mothers who've lost pregnancies, the mothers who've had failed adoptions, the birth mothers who've given up their babies. Like we're just not, we're not talking about those things. The mothers who have kids in the hospital, all of that. So yes. I you know, always like want to try to just remind people of the fact that Mother's Day is like equal parts, mm-hmm. incredibly painful for a huge percentage of the population as it is joyful for the other, for the other part. Can we talk about the depression for a bit too, because this is something I'm just so, you know, as your, as your friend and I do help you with some business stuff. I'm just so proud of you for, for 
for deciding to be more open and vulnerable around the depression because it's another topic we're not talking enough about and, and the connection between the drinking and the depression for you. Can you talk a bit about that? How, how what, what do you see as the connection between the alcohol and the depression for you? And what have you learned about, about that and, and maybe about some of the beliefs that you had around how it was helping? Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because I, I actually know a lot about depression, both personally and then professionally. I was a pharmaceutical sales rep who sold Prozac at the time. And when you go through pharmaceutical training, you, you learn about whatever physiological system it is that drug you're selling. You learn everything about that. So it's an in-depth, deep dive into depression. And at the same time, I was depressed <laughs> learning all this. I, I come from a family where it runs in the female line, but I also, as a kid, had a major head trauma. And so I'm not sure if they know a lot about head trauma and depression now too. So I'm not sure when it started exactly, but I'd always had some depressive episodes. And it wasn't until the infertility came in that I started drinking in response to something. I really wasn't, uh, I had episodes in college where I drank too much and this and that, but I wasn't linking trauma to drinking. But as a pharmaceutical rep and, and having you know these, these medicines that say, it does say don't drink, on the bottle or on the package insert. But other than that, it's not talked about in the medical community. And everybody I know on antidepressants is drinking <laughs> and I was drinking and really not even giving that a thought. And so the first major depressive episode that was so bad was after all the fertility treatments and after I'd had a bout with figure competitions, because that was really me trying to find some other identity right? to try something else on. And so when the, when the excitement of that wore off, I was right back where I was because I hadn't dealt with my insides, but I, I'm, I'm kind of going around a bit, but I want to say that I do recall when I decided to do those contests, I was telling all my friends and I, I literally would have dinner with people say, so listen, this is the last time I'm going to have a drink with you because I'm going to do this thing for like six to eight months. And they would be like, oh, you're kidding me. Really? You're going to do that? Oh my gosh. I can't believe you're not going to drink. And, but I felt inside a sense of relief that I had something to hide behind that I wasn't going to drink. Cause I, so I already knew on some level that my drinking was getting out of control. Hmm. So that kind of just came to me recently too. But so can I just, just so people are understand when they're listening. So you yeah. were doing like, it was like similar to sort of a female bodybuilding type thing with, yeah. And then as part of that, you would not drink for six to eight months leading up to competitions to get ready for that. And it, and that provided you with a really like with an excuse to not drink, which felt like a relief. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I could totally see how that would happen. I, I, I never had that. There was never, a, I never had that reason, but I could see that if I had had a reason that at a certain point that would have felt like a relief to me yeah. to, not, to not have to drink for a period of time and have like a really good excuse for that. Yeah. But it was very short lived because yeah. once literally the night of the contest, I would go out uh, with all my stage makeup and everything spray tan and, and mm -hmm. start drinking that night. Mm -hmm. So there was never any inner work mm -hmm. uh, done because alcohol is a depressant right <laughs> and here I am a person with depression who has had some major depressive episodes and all this time I'm drinking and I I'm seeing doctors seeing a therapist even at one point when I had a very bad episode I was put on some stronger psychiatric drugs through a psychiatrist to sort of level me out never was it mentioned hey and you you don't you should not drink during this right did anybody ask you how much you were drinking? Oh, yeah. And I'd say, oh, you know, not that much. Now, and that was a good enough answer for them, too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. but knowing what I know now about how dangerous it is, you know, so all this time I'm, I'm having these, I'd come out of a depressive episode and I'd go back into a deeper one. And this is pretty classic, too, that that, that happens, that you have a depressive episode, you come out, the next one is deeper. And you come out and the next one can be deeper. So I was in a pretty, pretty dark place and started seeing a therapist. And I, to this day, I still stay in touch with her. She's wonderful. 
And she was the first person who said to me, you know, alcohol is a depressant, right? And I'm like, yeah, but everybody, you know, everybody drinks. She was kind of soft pedaling, but she did put it in my brain. And then flash forward to the last few years, I, how do I say this? I knew that I was in trouble. I was having these depressive episodes and they were getting deeper. And I started to think about my drinking because the kind of drinker I was, was a binge drinker. I didn't sit at home at night and drink. I didn't drink alone. I always wanted to go out be with people. I didn't want to be alone with my feelings and thoughts and no children. I wanted to be the party girl. So I was always out drinking and I would over drink and binge drink on the weekends. And then I would be wrecked for like <clears throat> the rest of the week. And I would convince myself that I was okay because I would stop drinking during the week. Right. Uh, the, the whole detox, retox, fitness kind of cycle. Tell myself I was sweating it out and being healthy most of the time. But I would be so low from drinking. And at this time, I started Googling things like, am I an alcoholic? Do I have a drinking problem? And then I started Googling drinking and depression, mm. anxiety and drinking. And all of this information came up and I, and I started to read the science. I'm like, this, this is what's going on with me. Cause I'm the kind of person who researches things. So I just, then I kept reading more and more of it. And at some point I came across this naked mind and she started talking about that. And I thought, this is what's going on with me. Because before that you would think of everything else. Well, it must be that I eat dairy. It must be that I, right. um, <laughs> you know, I didn't want, I looked at everything else, but the alcohol, like of every, it couldn't possibly be that, you know? So I, cause I didn't want to give it up. But once I started making that connection, that was the beginning of me saying, I got, I have got to change. This is killing me. I would look in the mirror sometimes, maybe three or four in the morning when I woke up with my heart beating out of my chest and so much shame and guilt. I've probably done or said something stupid, looking at my phone to see if I text anybody trying to remember what I did. And I would stand in front of the mirror and I would go, what are you doing? You're killing yourself. You're literally killing yourself. You know, so it wasn't until I stopped drinking on September 14th of what, 2020. Yes. And, and I started the path on October 2nd. So a couple of weeks without any, just white knuckling it and journaling my face off. Mm -hmm. But even about four weeks into not drinking, I started to feel things lifting and changing. And that was enough of a motivation to keep going. Can you, can you describe more what you mean by that? Things lifting, like what was lifting and what was changing for you? What were you noticing? I was starting to look around and, and see colors again and feel more joy and have a little bit more energy. I would be maybe like humming. My husband would like, I haven't heard you do that in a long time. And appreciating getting outside more and just noticing and feeling things more. I wasn't feeling much. I was pretty numb because that's the thing about alcohol. It can't just numb the bad stuff, right? It numbs everything. Mm. And so I was in a place where I wasn't feeling much. The only time I felt or I thought I felt was when I was drinking a lot, right? You know, that myth. So I started to notice like, wow, I'm kind of coming alive again is what I felt like. And, the, and the, she's in there. She hasn't been out for the longest time, but I knew I wanted her to come out and that this alcohol was holding me back from so much, from who I wanted to be. And I had, I had kind of like stopped growing and with all this infertility and loss and sadness, I just stopped growing and the alcohol had kept me stuck because I couldn't imagine like, well, what else was there if I right. couldn't be a mom? Yeah. And now I see there's so much, yeah, it's just incredible. So the further I get away from alcohol, the more I can look back in a, in a cathartic way and not like staying stuck in the past, but look back and start to see these things. Like what happened with, 
the infertility and the anger I felt and the sadness and the being stuck and the false identity of this party girl. I, I now can see it all so clearly when I was in the fog of, and haze of alcohol and the constant recovery and trying to look like I had it all together. That was exhausting. That part was the worst, you know, the facade. That's exhausting. Yeah. Oh, I know. <laughs> I definitely know. I get, I get it. It's, it is so exhausting. And I so resonate with that feeling of, and, you know, as someone who, you know, been lucky enough to not have struggled with severe depression, that's never been, you know, I definitely have gone through periods where I've been depressed. And obviously when I was going through all the stuff with trying to have kids and there was mm -hmm. lots of, there was lots of like circumstantial depression that was going on, but I don't know that I was ever anyone with like a, with an, an additional kind of chemical depression happening. But I, I felt that same thing after I started drinking, I felt that same like lightning and lifting. And I just love the way you described it. I think it feels different to everybody, but it's amazing. It's amazing what happens when you take that away because as you said so well we're not just numbing the painful tough stuff we're also numbing our experience of all the good stuff and so suddenly these things that like up until that point maybe didn't feel joyful enough or funny enough or big enough or connected enough right. to cause us to feel anything positive suddenly we start feeling all the good feelings with those things and it not to mention the empowerment of stopping drinking and how great it feels to like take back that control and that yes. power. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. amazing. And the most incredible thing is that about six months into being alcohol free, I, I, I called my doctor and my therapist and said, I want to get off antidepressants. I, I, I want to try this. I wanted to see. And so I did it with medical supervision and titrated off of them. And I have not been on them since. I do not take antidepressants anymore. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. amazing. Now, I'm not saying this would happen for everybody, nope. but nope. this yeah. is, and I want to be clear on that because I, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, it's definitely a useful and wonderful medication, but I just felt how much it was actually the alcohol that was keeping me so stuck mm. and I don't need it anymore. Now I'm not saying I don't have depressive episodes. Yeah. I've always had that, but I've learned healthy coping mechanisms and self-care things that I've put into place that I now do mm -hmm. uh, when I feel that mm -hmm. coming on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's wonderful. And and I know, you know, from my own experiences to you that some people can reduce or mm -hmm. completely come off of medications and some people can't. So that's something that you're going to want to, you know, explore with your doctor and yes, definitely with your but doctor. I th but I think it's, I think it's just amazing. Every time I hear one of these stories about, you know, it's quite common that people with depression are drinking and, right. and thinking that it's helping somehow. And it's just amazing to me when I hear these stories from my clients who have stopped drinking about how much better they feel. And, and it's not just depression. The other piece of mental illness that, that, that is, it's just so directly impacted by drinking is anxiety. And that, that was something that you struggled with as well, mm -hmm. sort of social anxiety. And, and can you talk a little bit about what your anxiety, how your anxiety sort of manifested and what you noticed around the connection with alcohol, drinking and not drinking? Yeah. I've always been a little bit socially awkward <laughs> as a kid. And so I think I started the first time I drank something was Boone's Farm wine in, in the United States. I don't know if they have in Canada. It was like this horribly sugary alcohol for kids. It was like strawberry and blueberry. And a bunch of us would each get a bottle before mm. a football game and we drank it. And I do remember like thinking, oh, I'm like funny and fun and people like me. And that was probably the beginning of when I thought this helps with social anxiety. And, and that continued. And that was that, you know, through the rest of my life, socializing situations that always kind of warmed me up having a drink, right? There's no denying the fact that first 20 minutes of your first drink, you get this euphoria. Everybody's a little more chatty. Yeah. Everybody's loosening up. I mean, this is definitely what happens, but then we continue to chase that high and, and mm -hmm. we don't achieve that. But what I learned was so interesting. Dr. Andrew Huberman on the Huberman Lab talks about this, that people who are already deficient in, in neurotransmitters like serotonin and GABA 
someone like me who is, has depression, they, when they drink, they get charged up. It gives them energy. And it did that for me. I would be the one of those people that would keep going. Everybody else is getting tired and <laughs> falling asleep. And I want to keep going because it revved me up. So it had that effect on me. Mm-hmm. So, but of course, then I crashed well below normal levels the next day or a few days. And I was so much more down than I was before I started drinking. Right. You know, so that dangerous cycle to be in. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, he points out that even so on the days, even when you're not drinking, your pleasure baseline is lower and you can literally change that chemically change your brain and change your pleasure baseline. So you are lower. And that I believe was going on with me for years. Mm -hmm. So learning now, I, you know, I, to go out and it might be a bit awkward for the first few minutes, especially, you know, when people learn I'm not drinking anymore because I was quite the party person, as I said. So it can be awkward at first for people, but after those first few minutes, you know, then it's fine. And, and I, I feel so much more confident in myself now, not drinking. So ironically here, I thought this was giving me confidence, but really it, it wasn't. And it wasn't helping me connect with people. I was disconnecting. Right. You know, so now I'm so much more present when I talk to people, you know, I'm listening and responding. I'm not thinking about, oh, when am I going to get my next drink? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm connecting for real on a real level. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a good point. I know there's a couple of things that I, I, that I have learned around the social anxiety piece that have been helpful for me, because that was one of the reasons, at least that I told myself that I drank was that it made it easier. And, you know, I was a really painfully shy kid and I have always struggled with this like belief that I have that I'm not great socially with, you know? And so I, I think that that was one of the, that was one of the excuses or reasons that I gave myself the beliefs I had around drinking, but one of the things that I, I learned somewhere was that your body is designed to move you from kind of a more introverted, isolated, quiet state into a more extroverted social state. And your brain will do that on its own if you just give it time, mm. but it takes longer for that to happen than it would if you had a drink. And so I started going to parties and things when I first stopped drinking and I would just give myself permission to not be remotely interesting or say anything funny for at least like a half an hour, 45 minutes. Like I just took the pressure off myself. You can just hang around. Like that. You can hang around on the sidelines. You can have your, you know, your mocktail or your alcohol free beer or whatever it is you're drinking, but you don't have to be really engaging right away. These people who are drinking, they're probably going to get there before you. And then I experimented with that. I paid attention to it because mm. I don't know where I heard it, but I, I'd heard it somewhere. And I thought, I don't know if this is true, but I'm just going to go see, you know, I'm curious. And what I noticed was that that actually did happen and that there always comes a point, And I still, I still pay attention to this when I go out even five years later, but there's always this point where I realized, oh my gosh, I have now forgotten that I was feeling awkward. Like it's done. I'm in it. I'm having fun. I'm laughing. I'm in a conversation. Everything's fine and normal. So that was helpful to me around the, the social anxiety, the fact that we will eventually get there. And then, yes, you know, I loved that that thing that you said about how you actually have more confidence when you're out and you're not drinking and how you realize that actually helps you be less socially awkward mm-hmm. and anxious. And I had this client who described it as uh, she said, you know, it feels like it's the thing that's going to connect me with everybody else when I'm drinking. But what it really is like, she said, it's like, there's this box around me. And when I first start drinking, everybody's in the room, they're all in the box, but then the more drinks I have, the smaller the box gets until it's just me in there. And I'm, yeah. I'm having, I'm either having conversations with people and all I can think about is like myself and what's going on in my own brain. And did I just say something stupid? And what am I even saying? And does this, what's this person talking about? Because I'm so inebriated or, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm not even connecting with anyone. I'm off on my own somewhere in my own like little state, you know? And I thought that was a really interesting reflection as well. Yeah. Well, like, you know, how this belief that we have that it actually helps us be more social and connect better with people. So I love that. Thanks for sharing that. And then of course that like horrible anxiety thing that lasts for yeah. like, you know, and yeah, and I appreciate too. It's so great that you're on talking about, cause you know, a lot of the guests I have on here are drinkers. Like I was a drinker where I was drinking, mm-hmm. you know, most nights I would have at least a couple of drinks kind of thing. And you're in more in that category of binge drinking where you can, mm-hmm. you would go for periods of time and not drink during the weekdays, for example, and then drink too much on the weekends. And, right. and I think 
there are a lot of people in that pattern too. And the whole being able to take the break thing is often the thing that justifies it. You feel like, oh, yes. I'm okay because I can take this break and I don't, I don't need to have a drink every night. I'm not feeling that desire. But really what's happening is obviously you're over drinking and binging on the weekends, which is equally dangerous and dangerous mm -hmm. in different ways. But then also you're feeling this like low level crappiness all week as a result right. of that increased anxiety that's caused by the withdrawal from the alcohol on the weekend. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Interesting. and you know, the whole fading effect bias, like, you know, yeah. Monday, I'm not going to, Oh, I will not do that again. There is no way. Well, I'm going to just like sweat it out and have my green juices and work out really hard. And then Thursday mm -hmm. rolls around. You're like, Oh, you know, I'm yeah. okay. <laughs> you yeah. do it again. And then you're yeah. right back in that, in that cycle. Yeah. And my husband would say, what, why do you do this to yourself? You know, he would see me beat myself up. I didn't have a good answer for that, except for that I was stuck in, yeah. in that cycle. Yeah. But the good news is possible to get unstuck and you got unstuck and yes. I got stuck and you have a real knack for helping people get unstuck who are in this cycle. And it's partly because of the, you know, the work that you've done in the fitness industry and your own kind of passion for for, for overall mental and physical wellness, but you've got this real knack for helping people who are stuck in that detox to retox cycle who are mm -hmm. either like me, you know, it was a daily thing for me, yeah. you know, I'd get up, I'd started at some people for some of us is like starts in the morning. You're like, okay, this is it. Like I'm going to have my blueberries yes. and my steel cut oatmeal and my flax and like, you know, or my egg white omelet with my spinach. And then I'm going to have my green juice and I'm going to go for a run at lunchtime. And I'm going to just be super healthy. And that's going to balance out what happened last night. Or it right. might be like the whole week you're in the the detox cycle, like you were only to retox on the weekends, but exactly, um, yeah, you've got kind of a special niche and around, around all of that. And now I think developing this, this really so, so well, so needed and so just so important in supporting people who are drinking as a way to manage depression, depression and anxiety. And, you know, maybe in particular related to loss rec mm -hmm. related to re recurrent loss in an in infertility or adoption journey. And I just think it's, that's just so, it's so great. And I'm just, I'm just so delighted that you agreed to come on today, Maureen. I, I don't know how you sh did that. Everybody who's listening, <laughs> thinking what I'm thinking, which is how did this woman come on and speak in such a calm together way about this thing that is obviously absolutely massive in your life that you went through and but you did and I I think you're I just think you're so phenomenal I'm just so I feel so grateful to know you so thanks for coming on I really appreciate it well, thank you I feel so grateful to know you and I'm I'm really grateful for you letting me share my story here first no it's been it's really it's been my absolute honor you have a couple different ways people can find you right so on Instagram, you are Sober Fit Chick, correct? Sober Fit Chick LLC. I had to add that because somebody else. <laughs> Sober Fit Chick. So I'm Sober Fit Chick LLC. Okay, perfect. Sober Fit Chick LLC. That's Maureen. And then you can find more about Maureen and Maureen's coaching services on her website, which is what, Maureen? Soberfitchick.com. Perfect. So I will put all of that information in the show notes. You can go find out more about Maureen there. I encourage you to follow her. She's being very open and vulnerable and sharing the parts of her journey with the infertility, the depression, the anxiety, and, and alcohol. And I just think it's, I think it's, it's great. So if, if you just loved listening to Maureen, like I did, please go follow her there and find out more about her. All right, Maureen, honestly, I have so many things I could talk to you about, but I, I am, I am mindful of the time, <laughs> so many things, and maybe next year we can get you back to do this before mother's day. So we can get this out. I'd love to, I'd love to do an episode where we just talk about how to become more sensitive around this topic. I think that'd be a really helpful thing to just spend, like to really focus in on. Definitely. Cause people are doing their best, but there's, yes. so, I mean, oh my gosh, if I had like $10 for every time told me God had a plan. I mean, I just it's just too much. It just became too much for me. It's not, was not helpful to me to hear that. My On favorite the, was people would say, take my kids for the weekend. Then you won't want to have children. Like, oh, oh, wow. Perfect. So sensitive mm -hmm. and helpful. Yeah. I know so many, anyway, maybe we'll do that next year. I would love to do that in the next season, but thank you so much Maureen for coming on today and I'll see you soon. Thank you. 
You've been listening to Bite Size Balance with your host, Wendy McCallum. As a certified Naked Mind coach, I help busy women like you find freedom from alcohol. If you're starting to question your relationship with alcohol, you'll want to listen to my free three-part video series where I address the top three myths around why you think you need to drink. Sign up now at www.wendymccallum.com forward slash myths. That's www.wendymccallum.com forward slash myths.